My presentation is really not a formal presentation. It's a set of random thoughts about a career in evaluation which is now being transformed into a career in policy. And as we sat through lunch, I was sharing some of the trials and trepidations of an evaluator who is now in the position of being on the other side. And these random thoughts about the dilemma that visits this particular convoluted professional career. I'm speaking about evaluation of public policy ex ante. I've only been in this job for slightly seven or eight months and I'm still trying to feel my way through it. And the job essentially involves advising government. The job title is framed advice, development policy advisor to the president, but it's basically advising government on initiating policy measures, both continuation of current policies, but also initiating new policies that might help to transform the vision of those who won the elections and to preside over the transformation of the economy. And this presentation is going to focus really on three fundamental uh, points. The first one, again, thinking aloud, is making a distinction between policy and politics. Most associate this distinction to be a rather blurred one. When it's translated into programs and projects, it may not appear so blurred. But at the highest level of public policy, the line between politics and policy is very, very blurred. And every now and then, they merge into each other. So that's the first pillar of my presentation. The second is evaluating policies from the point of view of those who are inside the policy making process. And indeed, that process is one that is a very tricky one and a complex one to articulate. And then the third, which is really where I come from on the evaluation ladder, is ensuring participation, both in the policy process but also in the evaluation of that policy process. These are three fundamental questions that I have continued to struggle with over the last few months. Number one, politics versus policy. In politics, there is a simplification, in fact, an oversimplification of very complex phenomena into very simple, catchy words and frames. You might even call them slogans. The president I serve now won the elections and the very contested, heavily contested elections in 2008 with a major slogan on a better Ghana. That slogan itself has seeds of evaluation in it. A Ghana that's better than the one he's come to inherit as president. And better in relation to a number of key indicators which are framed in terms of employment, in terms of better well-being, and also in terms of an inclusive democracy. But this better Ghana, having been successful in winning an election with a slogan, now comes the real test of translating the slogan, this vision, into a set of public policy objectives that will deliver the goods. And this is where the snag comes. First, who makes this definition? Who makes this articulation? There is a manifesto which the political party used to get this message through. And it came with all manner of uh, communication devices that allowed the population to buy into this vision. And by the way, this was a party which was in opposition 
So it was an uphill battle to sell this message and to convince the majority of Ghanaians that this was a better vision to associate with. The biggest challenge then, once victory got established, was do you continue with the manifesto? And in, for many people who know about manifestos, they usually catch all documents. Every manner of promise is made in the manifesto. Anything that appears to be appealing is included in the manifesto. So the critical challenge is upon victory, when you become an elected government, how do you translate your manifesto into much more refined, objectively verifiable set of uh, indicators that will guide you into the implementation. Now, in evaluation, we talk about the theory of change. We talk about all the nice terminologies about how you might frame both the implementation, but especially the evaluability of your policy program or project. Well, that's the good news. The not so good news is once you get elected, you probably do not have any time. You want to, you are already challenged from day one to take the promises and implement them as is. And the jury for policy makers and politicians is not a bunch of evaluators. It is the electorate. They are the ones who start scoring you on promises and procedures from day one of being elected. And therefore, there is almost, you try to juxtapose your promises against the reality that you now discover. And this was the first dilemma that we are confronted with. On the one hand, you have a bunch of politicians who are intent on fulfilling the promises by hook or by crook, even though the promises in many respects have very, very contradictory and sometimes almost impossible trajectories to, to, to figure out. Now, how will such a dilemma be dealt with? I think that evaluators are uniquely placed to then begin to disentangle the politics from the policy and claim some kind of objective assessment of what the priorities are likely to be. But as you can imagine, you will be drowned out by those who want, from the very day they are in power, project the winning of the next election. So in the big house, you have an intense debate between those who want a systematic public policy process orchestrated by institutions whose mandate it is to make policy and those who, after all, want the mandate to execute programs and policies that will transform the lives of people. Who wins? It's a chicken and egg problem. In fact, as of last week, this problem was being tackled by the National Development Planning Commission, which said, well, the way you establish priorities is to hear from the presidency what the president's priorities are for transforming the economy of the, of the country. Another school of thought, no, the way you embark on policy is to have an objective assessment located in the National Planning Commission that will define the most logical path for transformation in the country. I leave that dilemma to the postscript, whether we survive in this experiment or we don't. The second area that I talked about is the evaluation of public policy almost real time. And this is different from the evaluation of programs and projects that are located at subsidiary levels in ministries, departments, and agencies, and also with the decentralized units uh, of government, especially for municipal governments. For many, many years, there has been attempt, and some of it successful, in creating an apex body at the highest level of decision making that will champion evaluation in developing countries. This is a very, very tricky process to establish. On the one hand, 
the very highest level of decision making is generally implicated in the process of policy making and policy direction. But at the same time, having an internal monitoring and evaluation unit that is capable of coming to grips with the key indicators of success which have to be executed and used at the process of, of policy reform. And so, as Ray uh, correctly mentioned, one of the prime movers of the process of creating an internal evaluation unit at the highest levels of government was Mrs. Jenny Hesse uh, a few years ago, who was the chief advisor to the president on evaluation and hence established this unit. Over the last year or two, an attempt has been made to transform this unit into the Office of Evaluation and Oversight. Even though this is intended to be an internal evaluation unit, itself has come across some bitter opposition between contending forces at the highest levels of government. And the opposition is twofold. One, it is perceived as a unit that has oversight over the ministerial level, implying that at, in its relationship between the presidency and the, the, the ministries, it is perceived to be an external evaluation unit. And therefore, there is a lot of traditional fear about this is where accountability is exacted. And this is where non-performance can be registered. In the past, it did perform that role. Increasingly, that role is being caught up in all the conflicts associated with who did what, when, and how. And therefore, in the interaction between the policy unit and the evaluation unit, you tend to face some tremendous challenges. Fortunately, as an evaluator, you are able to empathize with those who are in the evaluation unit, but when it comes to the dialogue about whose priorities are to be evaluated and when that evaluation occurs, you run into a serious question both on the issues and on the methodology to be used. As we speak, a process is now being initiated, thanks to participatory monitoring and evaluation, to begin to work with the various stakeholders to define what the critical issues for evaluation might be. Second level of conflict. In the Planning Commission, and there are a lot of colleagues here from the Planning Commission, there is a growing debate that the evaluation unit of the Planning Commission should be the pivotal one to undertake programmatic and project evaluation. And that policy evaluation should be left, that the President's office should be left exclusively dealing with policy evaluation. In the ideal world, there's a synchronization of these two functions so that you have strategic evaluations intended to direct national public policy uh, reform and you have more operational evaluation that is chaired by the Planning Commission in coordination with the sectors. That seems ideal and I think we are looking at borrowing some of the trajectories and experiences in South Africa to establish this healthy balance between strategic evaluation and evaluations that are programmatic and operational. The third one, which is the involvement and engage, engagement of popular grassroots stakeholders in the whole process of public policy making and correspondingly in the process of the evaluation of policy. This we haven't quite started. In fact, we, start, we had a false start. And the false start, for those of you who are from Ghana and who are scholars and monitoring the, the process of public policy, that false start came about six months ago when we initiated something we call the town hall meetings, which were at one instance a vehicle for participatory policy making, and at another instance, was the expectation that these, over the years, will become platforms for participatory monitoring and evaluation of public policy. As a policymaker or as an advisor to the policy process, 
I don't know why the, this, this, this did not fly. But as an evaluator, I suspect I know why it did not fly, even though I'm not allowed to say so, unless I'm in a platform in Carleton University and may not be quoted from it. But the fact of the matter is that that platform opened up a peephole towards the space of expression of interest of a wide variety of people. And once you open the Pandora's box, you hear and feel and record a whole gamut of assessments which may not be popular nor palatable to the politics of the country. For policy and joint decision making, it may be an interesting dynamic, but when it comes to the real issues that citizens have to express, it may not necessarily be. And after two um, town hall meetings, the process was somehow suspended to be reviewed and be reformatted. That's the policy language. And so with these three pillars that provoke random thoughts of you know, an evaluator turned policy advisor, I would hope that a system might emerge which has the following characteristics. Number one, that there would be continuity in the process of public policy decision making at the highest level. And there has been some indication of that continuity, both at the office of the president, but also and especially at the level of the Development Planning Commission, which after all is the one institution that is designed to have longevity and sustenance in both the professional aspects of public policy decision making, but also in the coordination of uh, decisions surrounding the National Development Plan. What will likely emerge is a creative interface that allows strategic decision making to reside in the presidency without inhibiting the process of more routine, more systematic decision making at the level of the National Planning Commission. Number two, and this is a, a, a very, very profound uh, challenge that faces Ghana but also faces many developing countries, is where to locate the institutions that will evaluate public policies and programs in a manner that is independent of the politics of the time. For now, there is a plurality of centers. Some of it is increasingly located in the parliament, which works with results of evaluation and audits from the Auditor General and then takes it up sometimes in a partisan but most times in a nonpartisan manner as an independent institution of oversight and therefore creates the demand not only for evaluation, but also allows for maybe effective utilization of evaluation to feed back into public policy reform. Finally, how you scale up the voices, perspectives, and capacities of citizens resides in two fundamental pillars. Number one, a vibrant civil society that increasingly dares to challenge public policy pronouncements and engages in the process of advocating for change, sometimes using popular means, other times using very participatory ways of policy evaluation. These are a few random thoughts, and I would hope that through whatever questions that you wish to generate, we can begin to exercise dialogue as we also exercise our preparation for the Uruguay match tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> uh, let it just be noted that the United States was not thrashed by uh, Ghana. Uh, the, the choice of terminology there, Suli, is, is 
um, slightly inaccurate. But other than that, it's all, <laughs> it's all right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, this is a very serious man. This is a, 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 a great benefit for us and a great opportunity to listen to Suli. He is working at the apex of the power structures in the nation of Ghana, uh, which is building a strong democratic tradition. And some of you may know uh, this, but others of you may not, that Barack Obama, who is the president of the United States, since his election has made one visit to one African country. And the one African country he went to was Ghana. And it was in part to show solidarity and to show support for the transition of power in Ghana from one president, the one who lost the last election, to the new president who Suli is working for. That election was decided by 23,000 votes across the entire nation of Ghana. And the prior president stood down, the new president came into power, and the transition took place. Barack Obama wanted to affirm that. He did not go to Kenya, which is the homeland of his father. I mean, I think it's just very important to understand the powerful symbol that the transition in Ghana has meant to all African countries and to countries around the world that take seriously the democratic process and the transition of power. Um, it is, it's, it's a great event that took place in Ghana, and it's wonderful that Suli is at the, at the heart of this now. And um, he is an ally of IPDET, he is an ally of ideas, and he is an ally of clear and cogent and thoughtful thinking in the office of the president of Ghana. Suli, thank you. It's been, it's really great, it's really great to have you. It's an honor, I think we have to say. Do we have time? Is there anyone who would like to? We do have a bit of time. Uh, questions for Suli? If you would, the mic is back here. If you. Yes, ma'am. The, the mic is right over here at the end of the food table. Please introduce yourself when you ask your question to Suli. And I will say, keep your questions short and concise. Uh, this is not a time to start making long statements. Okay. My name is Sarah Chigun from Uganda. In Uganda, we, I think the people who are responsible for making policy is the taking go officers. The minister is responsible for, in, for presenting the policy in cabinet. So my belief is that the taking go officers still have a big role to play. But we need to find a way of embedding evaluation into that decision making process. Okay, thank you. Anyone else with questions for? Our colleague from Trinidad, Tobago. Hi, good day, Claude L. McKellar from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, you talked about some of the challenges in moving from an evaluation background into policy formulation. Has it been easier to embark upon policy formulation because you, you have this sense of how those policies will be evaluated down the road? Does the background make it easier? Yeah. Interesting. Yes, please. Uh, hi, my name is Shuba. I'm a member of the Community of Evaluators for South Asia. Uh, my question, first of all, it's congratulations uh, to you and uh, you know, to be in the position you know, to, in a country where evaluation is given that kind of a role. Uh, it's a model that all of us can try to emulate. Uh, my question is specifically with regard to the uh, follow-up to the town hall uh, sessions. And I, I suspect that that was a, a, a kind of approach to ex-ante evaluation with participation of the people that may have been uh, attempted. Uh, and I couldn't quite uh, understand why it didn't work because I mean, the whole dynamic of a town hall is much more kind of a rah-rah mobilizing opinion as opposed to kind of, a, kind of a thoughtful, systematic feedback process. So I'm wondering if uh, you have some other options that you're developing, if you could uh, you know, talk about that a little bit, what you're thinking to follow up that with. 
Great. Thank you very much. Sully, let's take these three and then. Well, thank you very much. The, the first one was a, a very useful comment about balancing the role of the technician with the politicians. And it's absolutely crucial because often the technicians will continue to rely on policy and political direction from the apex of decision making. And they prefer to focus their attention on translating this policy direction, political leadership into concrete implementable policies. Two experiences, one in Ghana uh, back in the early 2000 period where technicians actually took the lead in formulating the national strategic plan using very objective technical assessments. Midpoint, the government of the day did not buy into that and simply created a different island called the President's Special Initiative. So this was a period where there was uh, divergence between what the technicians said and what the politician wanted to do. Happily in the same regime by 2005, the technicians waited for some indication of the political direction and used that as a basis for formulating what appears to work. And that was a, a, a happy union. And with that tradition, we're now faced with the same situation in which the technicians in some ways have shied away from taking the kind of lead they did in early 2000 in directing national public policy. And so the tricky thing is the technicians have come out with the body of the policy and have left chapter one for the politicians to determine what direction they want to go. We're still working out the details as it is. Yes, in advising on public policy, I find per, at the personal level a type of crisis, a crisis which suggests that you look at the evaluability of the policies that you are advising on. And that is creating problems because it presents you as a skeptical policy advisor. You know, why are you being critical when in fact you're supposed to get on in a very bold and decisive way with policy advice? And that dilemma can be resolved in one of two ways. If you're too scared, leave the kitchen, they say. Because skepticism might suggest that you're not sure of the policy advice you're given. But if you want to be decisive, then damn the consequences and get on with breaking the egg in order to fry the omelet. Now, this dilemma can be very, very uh, dangerous for an evaluator because you know that downstream there will be an evaluation either technically or in the court of public opinion, which is called an election. The third one is a very crucial question to address. In South Africa, the motto has been people first, and they have had tremendous initial success in these big pizzas, these big forums where citizens come like town hall meetings. And our colleague who has uh, trespassed these corridors, Indra Nedu, raised this fundamental challenge for those of us doing participatory monitoring and evaluation to say, how can we help this process? Because the way it is now, it's a huge amorphous set of town hall meetings in which people come and they scream their aspirations and their desires in a very unstructured way. And we've been thinking hard and working on the methodology for doing this and saying, what might be needed is a guided set of uh, evidence about performance or lack thereof, and therefore shaping the agenda of what might be town hall meetings by results of participatory evaluation exercises, which can give an amplified voice of those who are articulating those issues. So we haven't given up 
we're just looking for ways in which this can be better structured so that public policy making, even of a participatory nature, is fed by and based on evidence of what works and what doesn't work. Of course, it is important to allow citizens to amplify and exercise their voice and their rights through storytelling and other means, but these have to be framed in the context of evidence that is collected and presented in these public fora. If it is left simply as unorganized voicing of frustration, then it will end up being exactly what it is. We have two small gifts for Suli to say thank you. Uh, he has some roots here in Canada, given this is here where he did his PhD. Uh, we have a set of coins from the Canadian Olympics, from the Canadian Mint, for you. And I guess this is number nine of the um, uh, paperweights. Oh, thank you, right? including the ones I liberated. Oh, then maybe it's ten. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let us say thank you. Suli Gariba. Thanks, brother. Thanks very much.